good evening, everybody, and thank you for this attending what I think will be a really interesting um, uh, talk. I'm particularly interested to know from Michael about what um, being a master means. Um, I might learn something. Um, he is a, I think he joined the same year as I did in 1994, joined, joined the company. He became a liveryman in 1997. I'm pretty sure you beat me to that. Um, and you certainly beat me to being master because you were the master in 2012. Um, but in the intervening, you were also the clerk, I think, from 2005 to 2010. And uh, sort of, and, and you recently, uh, I think, was it 2019 to 20, you were the president of the BCS. So you're, I think, two away because the, uh, the, the, the office starts, I think I'm right in saying in March or is it the beginning of April? Um, the one thing you, of course, haven't done is I don't, the only thing you missed out on is being the chair of the charity. Michael, really looking forward to hearing what you have to say and over to you. Thank you so much for, for joining me tonight. Um, I, I hope that you'll enjoy the, uh, the journey over the next 70 minutes that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, and I'd like to take you, if I may, a little bit through my career when I worked for six different IT supplier corporations and my world of volunteering, which is really keeping me going. And of course, the great privilege that we all have of being members of this amazing livery company. As, as my children love to remind me constantly, none of the companies about which I get to talk exist any longer. That's nothing to do with me, of course. And as I keep trying to remind them, much more important than um, when you join a company is, is knowing when to get out. And the good news um, for this evening is that all of those non-disclosures that I've, uh, I've, I've had to sign over the years will no longer be effective tonight. So you might learn a few things about companies which you, you wouldn't otherwise have discovered. I, I hope that you'll um, enjoy uh, some of the anecdotes, certainly some of the turbulence um, uh, of the industry throughout my career, and a glimpse at some of the amazing people that I have been so very lucky to both work and, uh, and to meet with. Uh, and, and you might have a little bit of amusement in watching me grow up, if indeed I ever did. Some of these pictures I'm going to show you are over 50 years old. Uh, and, and perhaps those of you that are not quite as old as me, um, one of you might at some stage learn something from the multiple lessons that I've learned and, and the things that I've screwed up in my career, which I'm going to tell you about. OK, so here we go. Well, I, I guess probably like um, quite a lot of people, um, everything wasn't exactly perfect in my start of my life. Uh, my my father uh, was, was actually born in Australia. He was an RAF corporal uh, and he'd served in uh, Burma and India, but very sadly died um, in service for the RAF very shortly after the end of the war when I was about six months old. Um, my mother and I actually spent much of my childhood living under the roof of my grandmother's council house in Kent. It was not an easy start, I must say, and I don't mention this really um, uh, to get any sympathy from anybody, which I know I wouldn't anyway, um, but to illustrate the fact that I think recently emerged from some BCS, the, that's the British Computer Society research, which actually showed that the IT profession enables social mobility far greater than any of the other professions here in the United Kingdom, as indeed I hope that my future career came to prove. Well, life took a pretty extraordinary change for me at the age of seven and a half, and I was sent by the Royal Air Force Benevolent Fund to an English cathedral school. Um, which was in Rochester, founded, I can scarcely still believe it, in 604. It, it was, um, it was pretty tough. <laughs> it was a bit like the embodiment of uh, Tom Brown's school days. Uh, it toughened me up, which I most certainly needed. And uh, I did, from time to time, seek refuge from the occasional bullying in the tuck shop there. I obviously had become a child of charity. And I think from a very early age, I had... I was lucky enough to have a huge social conscience and a real sense of responsibility to try and pay back into society as a volunteer. It also, I hasten to add, taught me just how incredibly important education is 
for every single child. And indeed, my education was to influence and make a huge impact on my life in future years. And of course, has led to my current passion for education. This actually, <laughs> whilst I was still at school, was my first introduction to the city. My mother, to improve our lives, um, decided to go off and become a teacher. And of course, during college holidays, um, not having any money for childcare, etc., I used to join her at Lloyd's Bank in Threadneedle Street, <laughs> where at nine in the morning, um, I would say goodbye to her. And I was eight years old when I started doing this. And I would return to Threadneedle Street at five in the evening. Uh, I even discovered, I, well, I probably discovered most of the city walks. I even remember discovering our wonderful church, Bartholomew the Great. Um, if it was raining, my mum in her generosity and capacity gave me enough money to buy a ticket to the next station on the circle line. And of course, I very quickly learned that if it was raining, I could go the wrong way round. So that kept me nice. Of course, today she would have been arrested for all of that. But for me, it was just the most incredible um, opportunity to learn about the city and, and, and was the beginning of my love of our wonderful city. I didn't actually go to university, but I joined a, a company called Heinz. Yes, you got it. The Beans Means people. And I joined as, well, what they called in those days, a management trainee. I guess, really, the, the modern equivalent would be a, a sort of an apprenticeship degree. Uh, and I, I can remember my first day, having come from a very poor background, my desk was surrounded by incredible paintings. And the one immediately behind my desk was actually an original Salvador Dali. Mrs. Hines wanted to educate all of us. And, and it was great. My boss... Uh, was quite a well-known guy, actually, he, uh, Tony O'Reilly. Some of you may remember him. Um, he played uh, rugby for Ireland. Um, mm -hmm. and, it, and it was during this period of time that I probably had my first lesson of my career. Uh, and it was all about a handwritten thank you note. Uh, by extraordinary luck, um, Mr. Hines every year used to ask me to go and uh, greet the guests at his Ascot Week party which was in a, a different mansion each year. And, and I got to meet such amazing people as Paul Getty, um, Jack Cohen, who um, founded uh, uh, um, uh, Tesco. And I was always given a special instruction at my early age to keep a careful eye on Princess Margaret, who was at all of these. So, um, the, 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 but the real point is that when um, Mr. Hines returned back to Pittsburgh, each time he wrote me a wonderful handwritten note. And to be honest with you, um, I would have continued working for him at um, £12, five shillings a week for the next 10 years, just because of that little thing that he did, which gave me confidence and which I felt uh, uh, that, that I was appreciated. Well, I guess um, my strong social conscience um, kicked in about now. Uh, and as well as being involved in running uh, my local youth club down in Kent, I joined the Honourable Artillery Company, uh, that, that, which for those of you that don't know it, is a, <clears throat> a very famous reserve regiment. And I joined them at the age of 19 um, to do my bit for Queen and Country, which is basically what I'd been brought up to believe in uh, by my education. And by complete chance, um, and absolutely no planning on my side, it actually helped me um, soon to enter into the technology field. Gosh, I remember my, my first evening as a recruit at Armory House in City Road being screamed at by uh, the Sergeant Major, uh, who basically was telling me, I said, never ever volunteer. You're in the army now. You never ever volunteer. What a load of bunkum that was. And uh, I, I hope I more than proved that wasn't a, that wasn't a truism in, in life today. And I, I was very lucky. I went on actually to become a, a, a very young reserve officer. And how um, that volunteering actually changed and inspired a, a, a lot of my future life. Um, and, and as a spare officer, because I, I should admit that basically pretty much everybody in the HAC was capable of becoming an army officer, I had a great job and they sent me off to run and help run a cadet unit in Brixton, uh, where, of course, I realized for the first time what an incredible difference 
um, a, a cadet unit could make to a young person's life. So I'm massively proud of our livery company for the work that we do with both our sea cadets and our air cadet units. Well, life um, took on a bit of a, an unexpected and, and certainly a very unpleasant turn uh, when I reached 21. Uh, my mother died, they said, of a broken heart. She actually took her own life. Uh, and I resigned from Heinz, um, uh, really to try and recover my sensibility. Uh, and I decided to do something completely and utterly mad uh, to travel overland around the world. And that was in the days when the only people that did that were uh, American draft dodgers, because it was during the Vietnam War. Uh, it wasn't, yes, that is me on the right-hand side, I'm uh, embarrassed to admit. Um, at this stage, I'd run out of money to buy food, and so I had to sell my clothes. And these were the only things that I could afford at that time. Um, but I did actually continue wearing them all the way to Australia, and I can scarcely believe that they actually let me into the country eventually wearing these. Uh, it, it was an incredible experience. Um, I bought a, a very cheap bus ticket from Kingston Railway Station <laughs> all the way to India, uh, to the, the Delhi Railway Station. And uh, it, 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 it took me, obviously, over some amazing places. Uh, it took me through Turkey in the days when there weren't even any hotels on the southern coast of Turkey. And... Uh, 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 and I learned a lot as I went. Uh, this is a particular uh, picture I remember taking in Tehran. And it's a, a group of Muslim women doing their um, kitchen washing up in an open um, uh, drain by the side of the road. Uh, this was a good lesson for me. It got me arrested. <laughs> I lived to tell the tale again, I'm happy to say. And uh, I soon learned by the time I'd reached Kandahar in uh, in, in, uh, in Afghanistan um, that you don't photograph uh, Muslim women. So in fact, uh, this person on the right hand is me. And it was an incredibly uncomfortable bit of kit to wear, I have to tell you. Well, uh, Afghanistan, of course, I, I discovered that really before even the Russians, I think, knew where it was. Um, it was an amazing trip. And I went on, um, as you can imagine, uh, through India by trains and, and buses and so on, down through Malaysia. Uh, through the Khyber Pass, which was a, a, a great place. Um, and uh, I ended up in Australia, where, of course, uh, I had to work until such time as I could earn enough money to come back to the UK. Uh, I, I lived and worked for a while in Perth. It certainly didn't look like that 50 years ago. Uh, but the, the, main, the main thing about this was that it, 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 it was a great experience because uh, I caught a ship which was due to, to go into the knacker's yard when it got back to England. I shared a cabin with five people I'd never met in my life. Uh, there, were, there were no cabin portholes, and I think we were positioned approximately 18 inches above the prop shaft. Um, but of course, it was a fabulous opportunity to, to see the world. And uh, I, I went to New Zealand and Tahiti through the Panama Canal and and Venezuela and so on. And the only reason really for telling you all of that is because it gave me a burning ambition to spend the rest of my career working internationally. And of course, uh, also helped me uh, lead to my very first job in technology. I wonder if we could all remember the very first boss that we really ever had. And indeed, in my case, um, the first man who gave me a fantastic break in my career. It was Harry Hall here on the right. He, he was personnel manager of a company called Redfon Flight Simulation, uh, which was based down in Crawley in, in Sussex. It was a multi-million pound engineering and IT genius company selling to the world's airlines and, and military. And by great luck, I rose from being a, a personnel recruitment junior um, over the next six years to go on to become their marketing manager. This company was a STEM dream. Its products were oh, a combination of six axis motion systems, um, digital sound systems, uh, the very, very earliest computer generated image systems, all driven in those days um, by no less than 10 digital PDP 11s. I wonder if there's anybody who remembers those. Uh, my early job with them was to produce the promotional material for uh, 
uh, trying to sell our products around the world, um, setting up exhibitions, um, and really getting the uh, international press to know and, and learn about this little company in England, which began to do the most amazing things uh, for companies and organizations all around the world. This was a magnificent company. It gave me enough rope to hang myself or indeed uh, to really help me uh, kick off my career in the right way. Uh, I got to meet some interesting people there. Um, I, I hosted Senator Barry Goldwater, which some of you may remember. He was the US um, defense minister. Uh, I worked with delegations from uh, the airlines in China and Russia, and it was just an extraordinary um, way to be bounced into business on a, on a multinational basis. I think my biggest bit of luck there was for reasons completely beyond my comprehension, the United States Air Force actually allowed me to do the launch of this aircraft. This was um, AWACS, which is still in fact up there flying today, um, looking after us all in, in various parts of the world. Uh, it was a 707 with a big mushroom on the top. And I was um, permitted to bring all of my international aviation journalists up to um, Seattle, uh, Boeing Field, and to fly the inaugural flight down to Tinker Air Force Base. Um, and even then, uh, this aircraft was only full of about a, th a third of it, I guess, had IT kit in it. But even in those days, you could still see every single aircraft movement across six different states of America. And today, of course, this aircraft is rammed from uh, uh, the flight deck down to the tailplane with, with the most sophisticated IT kit you could ever imagine. Uh, the company, um, helped me to make my very first visits to the United States. Well, Texas, <laughs> let's put it, put it that way. Uh, and it, uh, also it introduced me to another part of America. We bought a company called the Evans and Sutherland Computer Corporation, who were based up in Salt Lake City. And they were world leaders in this whole area of early computer generated image uh, systems. And as a young man, I was so very lucky. Um, I was given a role to lobby, if I dare use that word in the current uh, uh, context of the news, I was actually lobbying a Pentagon uh, general um, and senators uh, who were in the defense business to try and uh, persuade them all to give their business to this little company in England, rather than our competitors, um, uh, Singer in Binghamton, America, and CAE up in Canada. And it, it, it really I guess began my love affair with the United States of which I still remain a very keen ambassador. Uh, just, just thinking of us looking at Zoom at the moment, <laughs> right back in those days, I did my first video conferencing. Um, my satellite time cost um, 15,000 uh, pounds each go. Um, just to hire the projector and an engineer was 7,000 pounds per hour. And of course, because of the satellite movements, I could only ever do a video conference for 25 minutes. But what, what, what a long way we've come and how proud I'm sure we all are at uh, what an incredible thing video conferencing and in our industry have done for us in these more difficult times. Well, it, it was time for me to eventually, um, after six years, to, to move on. Um, I really hadn't intended at all to join the computer industry. Um, and, and I answered this ad, if I'm strictly honest, really just to gain um, some interview experience, where, which I hadn't had for the last six years. Um, it, was, it was less money, um, but the people were absolutely fantastic. And, and eventually, I, I, I really did get bamboozled into joining them. And I, it wasn't really until I, I sort of joined in on my first week that I'd realized by luck again, I had actually joined a US-based, very young startup company in the super mini market. And they were, in fact, uh, much to my good fortune, the blue-eyed boys of the New York Stock Exchange in those days. And I found, really, for the second time in my uh, life, I joined an amazing company um, by nothing other than great fortune. Uh, I, I remember doing my... Um, you know, you know, some of the um, work that I worked on uh, was obviously in the, in the super mini area. Um, I actually got to run my very first kickoff 
which is a, a sort of an international sales conference, which some of you will be aware of, um, with Sterling Moss, who, who uh, were, was my guest speaker on this occasion. And uh, for those of you that have long memories of uh, very early TV ads, uh, there was one in which he was stopped um, by a policeman uh, where he did, uh, the policeman accused him of being, oh, I suppose you think you're Sterling, blooming Sterling Moss driving that far. So that's what that rather weird photograph is about. Um, things went much better than uh, I deserved. Uh, and strangely enough, the, the thing that probably um, really made a mark for me in those very early days at Prime was I ran the gala dinner for this conference in none other than the Merchant Taylor's Livery Hall in London. I wasn't a liveryman. Uh, a friend of mine um, got me in there. And, and of course, because the uh, president of uh, uh, the American board came over with all of the board members, it blew them away. The sort of things that we are so used to doing, if you introduce those to an American for the first time, you can do nothing other than be incredibly lucky. And guess what? I got on the president's council. So it, it was a great start to the next um, luck-filled and really fun-filled six years of my career, um, which, to be frank, um, really began a period for me beyond my wildest dreams. Having come from a very modest background, uh, what, I, what I started to experience in this wonderful world of business and technology was quite something I, I didn't even realize existed. Uh, my first global product launch uh, was actually set in the grounds of a French chateau uh, for a product called a Prime 2250. Isn't it amazing that we still don't manage to have uh, named our products any better than that? Um, I flew in um, 500 um, international European customers um, in the morning and in the afternoon I flew in um, 200 um, European IT press uh, for, for the session in the afternoon. It was actually if I'd realized the risks I was taking, I would never have done it. But, the, you know, when, you, when you're young and you're, 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 you're not, perhaps not terribly, uh, uh, shall I say, savvy, you do things which you probably should never have done and, and, and some, sometimes actually work. This was a simultaneous show. So um, we were acting and, and uh, showing the products and, and showing customer sequences and so on in this marquee in a... Um, uh, in a chateau in France, and at exactly the same time, the same people, well, different people were moving around the stage uh, in my Boston-based um, HQ. Of course, this was the day of the big budgets. <laughs> I don't think anybody's going to be doing anything like <laughs> quite like this in this day and age. Um, but but the, it, it was a great it was a great event, um, largely because it worked. Um, it, it was all about the early days of packet switching. And uh, we were trying to demonstrate that a super mini could switch messages across the Atlantic in, in no time at all. I, of course, didn't believe it would work at all. So I can, I can remember being really, really stroppy with everybody and insisting on having 35, um, 35 millimeter projectors behind the screen uh, so that at least I could pretend it was working when it didn't. Well, to my complete amazement, it did work. Um, which, which also obviously amazed some of the audience because when I came to do a Q&A uh, with, with the customers at the end, um, one gentleman jumped up and said, uh, listen, I, I'm, uh, I'm with uh, the Bank of America out of uh, the city of London, and I'm going to give you a piece of paper with my pass details to my bank in New York because I simply do not believe what is, you appear to have uh, just told us happened. Uh, I don't know whether I was a, a little more pale than the, uh, the, the, than the chief engineer as I passed in the bit of paper, but blow me down, it actually worked. And of course, it made that product and it helped make um, Prime become really famous and well-known in the European markets and, and, and not just the US. Well, I, shortly after that, um, my American boss, who was uh, based in a wonderful downtown Hounslow at that stage, <laughs> um, met me in our Paris office uh, on a Wednesday and just simply turned around to me and said, well, Michael, I've, I've just been promoted. Um, I'm going to start working in Boston, uh, in Massachusetts on Monday, and I want you there, please. And I want you to be there uh, and have a new career over there. Well, that was more than quite a challenge uh, for my wife and, and my three children, 
um, which, which in fact includes um, one young, or then he was young, Down syndrome son. My first show in the US was in Los Angeles. Uh, and I've got to tell you a little anecdote about this. Uh, I, I, was, I was quite good at putting up <laughs> exhibition stands at this stage. And there was a bloke opposite um, on the other side of the, uh, of the gangway who was really struggling with his stand. And uh, so I, I went over and I said, look, you know, I, I, I've finished my thing. You know, can I give you a hand at all? And he was very grateful and, uh, and thanked me. And, and we, we got his stand sorted out. At the, uh, on the last day of the show, when, when the, we were breaking down our stands, he came over to me and he said, uh, Michael, you know, thanks for your earlier help. Um, actually, this is my formal launch of my company today. And tonight I'm going to be holding a bit of a party um, in a canyon down the road, a bit of a Tex-Mex party. And after that, um, from 10 o'clock tonight until four o'clock tomorrow morning, I have hired um, Disneyland. And would you please come along and be my guest? Uh, and of course, it was only later that I realized that it had been Steve Jobs, and that was actually the launch of Apple Computer. So what, what a wonderful, uh, what a wonderful uh, chance encounter that was. Um, I, I got on and did lots of kickoffs, lots of product launches and sales meetings and spent my life wandering around in Dallas, um, Los Angeles, Atlanta, and so on. Uh, and of course, these were the days when we were giving software away for free, can you believe? Um, and I, I suddenly came across a wonderful opportunity whereby um, my Australian um, country manager decided he wanted to be the first person ever to produce a TV ad for a computer. And, uh, and because there were some difficult tax implications in Australia, he gave me the job to do it in London. And uh, I had great fun um, making what I believe genuinely to be the first ever computer um, TV ad with Doctor Who and Lala. So we've got a copy here of one of those TV ads. Doctor, the universe is about to end. What? We need the orbital coordinates of 900 planets of the constellation of Casturbaris in 17 seconds. 17 seconds? 16. Constellation of Casturbaris in how many seconds? 11. Good interaction so far. 900 planets? 10. Excellent response. Come on, Doctor. 900 planets in how many seconds? 3. 3 seconds? 1 second, Doctor. 1 second. Well done, Prime. Prime computer. Not so loud. Prime computer. That's better. Of course. All pretty basic stuff, <laughs> but great fun. Oh, and by the way, I did at one stage catch a Doctor Who with Lala in a heavy embrace um, round the back of the studio. And I'm delighted to say that they actually married shortly afterwards. So that was, that, that was a great fun. Um, it, it was about then that, um, of course, all good things do come to an end, as we all know. Um, IBM moved into most of the prime um, senior management roles in America, um, in, in the usual sort of um, company maturity um, swing of, of, of young startups and, uh, and, and started replacing a lot of people with their IBM US mates, as of course we traditionally do in our industry. Anyway, I decided probably very unwisely to return to the UK as their marketing director. And shortly after that, um, I joined a Boston-based PR uh, an advertising agency, and I start, started working with a company called Wang, uh, who in those days were the world's top word processing experts. Uh, and uh, perhaps more important than that, it was about this time that I came upon a remarkable voluntary opportunity, which, which had a huge impact on my life. One of my colleagues, um, from this uh, advertising agency in Boston phoned me up one day and he said, Michael, I've got a niece who is very, very sadly um, dying from leukemia, but her one passion um, in her life has always been to come to the United Kingdom and to ride horses. So my secretary and I um, sat down in, in London and we tried to work out a program um, to look after this little girl. The, the, the mother and the little girl came and stayed in my home in Farnham in, in Surrey. And we did lay on the most extraordinary thing. I found that every single person I asked a favor of would say yes. So the King's Troop took her and out into Hyde Park 
uh, with, with the gun carriages. Um, even Princess Anne took her for a ride. And, and unbeknown to me, um, uh, the, when, when the mother and the, and the little girl returned, sadly, the little girl did die. The mother wrote a book about the experience. And uh, this is uh, where, where my extraordinary, really first charitable op um, opportunity happened. Uh, I, was, um, I, I received a phone call from a lady here whom some of you might perhaps recognize. She's Emma Sands. Uh, she, she was one of the stars in that dreadful TV series, Dynasty or Dynasty, I think as Americans called it. Um, and, but she was the founder of uh, the Starlight Children's Foundation, which was an extraordinary organization looking after terminally and critically ill children and their families and granting wishes. And uh, I, I became one of the four founders of the Starlight Foundation uh, here in the, in the United Kingdom, which I'm really thrilled to say continues to be a very successful session. Uh, mind you, in those days, um, for reasons beyond my comprehension, most wishes were actually by children and families to go to Paris uh, and uh, look around Paris and go to Dis uh, the Disneyland over there. And um, I found that through my connections with uh, the IT industry in Paris, I could provide a program for these families over a weekend that actually money could never have bought. And uh, it, it, it taught me just how generous people can be, particularly for children, and how wonderful our own industry was. Uh, again, you know, pick up the phone and ask anybody, Apple, Wang, whoever, whoever you liked, to do something exceptional, and they would always say yes. Um, so I, I actually completed 15 years service with that organization. It was such an incredible privilege to touch the hearts of so many amazing needy families. Um, well, let, let me get back, shall I, to the advertising and PR agency, uh, which went by the wonderful name of Hill Holiday, Connors and Cosmopolis. Um, now, it did actually, it was quite a famous company. It took both Lotus Development and Wang, um, basically from a garage business to a multi-million dollar pound global company. Um, and, and of course, it was driven by extensive um, advertising budgets and PR events uh, uh, around the world. And I found myself working um, for the first time with the European marketing director, who, strangely enough, was a good friend of most of us. And it was Ken Olissa, and uh, who was, of course, to come and play quite a, a, an important part in, in my future life and career. We had Fabulous, uh, we had 22 million pound advertising budgets, <laughs> uh, which was quite ridiculous, of course. And I got back into doing TV advertising, uh, major press events um, across Europe with, with some uh, wonderful fun. I mean, this was, this was sheer fun. I mean, to be paid to do this was quite extraordinary, really. Um, however, I didn't get everything right. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, Sir Ken will well, well remember this one. Um, that they Wang had just introduced um, the world's fastest word processor, and uh, and uh, uh, Ken Alyssa came to me and he said, "Right, okay, Michael, come up with some ideas uh, so that we can capture the press and uh, do something fun on this." So uh, I, I set set way in my normal creative, completely off the wall um, schemes and came up with this one, uh, which, as you will discover, was not altogether successful. <laughs> Uh, this uh, I, I hired a, a coach on uh, the express train from wherever it was, St Pancras to Manchester. Um, gave the um, gave the driver a few uh, a few crispy um, fifty pound notes uh, uh, and tried to persuade him to make it the fastest uh, route uh, journey that he'd ever done. And uh, installed a number of these wonderful uh, Wang word processors in the carriage so that all of my journalists could actually fiddle with the product and feel the product. As, uh, as we were on our journey. Well, I, I think we were probably 300 yards outside um, the London station, when of course the power surge blew all, of my, uh, <laughs> blew all of my word processors. The good news was, of course, that I had a very ample bar on board and I'd also bought with me Sterling Moss. So, you know, all part of the speed and all part of the image. And I had at vast um, expense and a great deal of trouble 
um, found this extraordinary um, ride up in Alton Towers where I proceeded to take all of the journalists. And, uh, and as you'll notice there had managed to fit um, completely insanely uh, a Wang word processor on the front. And Sterling's job was to put on a bowler hat, uh, carry an umbrella and sit in the front of this carriage on this horrible ride. Uh, he took one look at it and said, sorry, Michael, over my dead body, am I getting into that? Um, Ken Alyssa looked at me and said, uh, Michael, your stupid idea, your problem, you, you get in and do this. Um, what I hadn't anticipated was that it was going to take my, my photographer um, six different rounds to actually get the picture that would work for the press. Um, after the third round, they had to stop this um, horrible ride. I had to get out and unfortunately um, be a little ill. Uh, and then on the subsequent rides, each round I was a, a little more ill, but we got the picture in the end. So I just want you to know that not everything <laughs> that, that these crazy people do in the inter industry in those days worked out completely correctly. But we did get great coverage. Um, we also went on uh, to open a factory in, in Scotland uh, with uh, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. And I can remember handing over one of these wonderful word processors um, to His Royal Highness, who instantly smiled at me and handed it back to me with words, something along the lines of, Michael, I've got no idea what to do with this, but I'm sure you'll, you'll have a, a purpose for it. So, of course, it ended up in the Starlight uh, offices in London, as you can imagine. Well, uh, we went on to do uh, lots of wonderful product launches in, in Brussels, um, and I had some interesting um, encounters with Dr. W uh, with Dr. Wang and his family. I, I'll, I'll mention just one because it was one of my biggest nightmares of my career. Um, you may remember that Wang went through a little bit of a problem and its stock price halved literally overnight. And of course, would you know my luck, but I had actually flown over um, Dr. Wang, and first thing the very following morning, uh, we had an interview with Matthew, who was the tech um, uh, journalist for the Financial Times. N not great timing. <laughs> and, and Matthew did the inevitable thing and turned, of course, to Dr. Wang right at the beginning of the interview and, and asked him how he felt today being worth exactly half as much money as he was the previous day. And I leant over to the doctor to try and think of some suitable words for him. At which stage he looked back at me and he said, no, Michael, don't, don't worry about this. I, I'm fine. And, uh, and he turned around to Matthew with the most perfect answer. And he said, Matthew, you probably don't know, but when um, I and my family arrived in the United States all those years ago, I had precisely $100 to my name. And, uh, and of course, I've got several million to my name today. So I, I'm not that fussed. I thought it was great. It's wonderful to see these people in incredibly difficult situations and what they come up with. Um, of course, uh, I, I actually, one of those wonderful companies I left working for at the right time. Unfortunately, of course, um, uh, Wang went through a demise, I believe largely because uh, of the nepotism of Dr. Wang, who put his son, Fred Wang, as, he, um, as the CEO, rather than a, a very brilliant man, John Cunningham, who was doing at the time a great job. Well, um, it, it was about now um, that I joined a company which probably many of you have worked for at one stage or another in your lives. In the mid eighties, I joined ICL at the request of the president of International who happened to be an ex-prime um, computer um, manager from Scandinavia. Uh, and, and the job, of course, was to try and uh, make that massive move from dependency on mainframes to departmental systems. Well, I, I couldn't believe my luck. The, the, the first week I spent in Florida uh, on the Phil Crosby quality course, whose process um, I was tasked to set up across the world. Uh, it, it was a big drop in salary, but I, I have to be honest with you, it proved to be, in my experience, the best investor um, in me as an employee than anywhere else I, I worked in the, in the whole of the industry. Um, I got used to being sucked dry by American companies, and this was a, 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 an extraordinary company with great intellectual capacity, a lot of very, very smart people, and uh, and it was a it was a great experience. I, I got into more very dramatic international product launches. 
um, one of which um, some of you might remember. I don't think it lasted long, but it was called The All-in-One. Uh, and it was the brainchild of, of a, a delightful man called Andy Roberts. Uh, we did major press events uh, in Brussels. Um, and, and actually, I think that the, the most fun job uh, and the one I most enjoyed with, with ICL was that I ran the ICL Global User Group. And I had that uh, unenviable task, which I thoroughly enjoyed, of delivering all of those very challenging messages <laughs> that, the, that the customers around the world wanted the prime senior management team to hear. Um, it, it was a fantastic company. Uh, and I found myself working with the most wonderful, wonderful team uh, of country managers. Very professional organization. By the way, the gentleman on the extreme left here, um, was um, Alan, um, gosh, I'm having a senior moment, I can't remember his surname now, um, but he was actually one of the founders of our livery company, and of course a managing director of ICL UK in those days. A great team, um, and I, I was able to take them with my passion for traveling for the first um, IT industry events that took place in, in Hungary and, and places like Turkey. Uh, then I made probably one of the biggest mistakes of my entire career. Um, the, the international vice president uh, in his new role turned around to me and he said, uh, well, Michael, I think what I'd like you to do is to come up with an idea that will help build um, the camaraderie and friendship um, uh, around the country manager team. And uh, I made a terrible mistake. <laughs> I came up with... Um, uh, bringing them all from Japan, Australia, and other parts of the world, up to John Ridgway, who you may remember was a great world adventurer who rode the Atlantic and did all sorts of other mad things. And uh, we took them up to Cape Roth, uh, where um, unfortunately it turned out that my boss wasn't quite the he-man that I thought he was, uh, in spite of being an, an incredible yachtsman and jogging with his wife every morning. And every single insane thing that John Ridgway asked us to do, um, my boss declined in front of the entire team and basically um, set a bit of a rift. <laughs> the, the, the members of the country, of course, or the country managers, of course, uh, were all vying with each other to do all of these ridiculous things better than each other. And frankly, um, they did develop into a phenomenal team of, of whom I had even more respect at the end for some of the stuff that they put up with on this. Um, but uh, sadly, it was probably <laughs> a career limiting experience for me. And it certainly was for my boss, who actually left the country and went off um, to work in the United States. Uh, the, the other notable thing that happened to me <laughs> in ICL was that I suffered a shark attack <laughs> when I was out um, trying to make some arrangements for the uh, worldwide uh, top salespeople. Um, they all thought it was extremely funny when I came back to um, Putney, um, the uh, ICL headquarters on crutches, uh, until I actually I, I showed them the hammerhead shark that had done the damage on me. And, and I explained to them that sadly the blood on it was not that of the shark, but of mine. Anyway, I, you'll be pleased to hear I'm gonna move on very quickly, but just to say one thing, um, this was a, a major learning lesson for me because the gentleman um, that had enticed me to go into ICL, having then left to go and work in the United States, the last I heard of him, or should I say of his lawyer, um, he joined a company called Symbol Technologies, where um, several millions of pounds or millions of dollars went missing. And his lawyer in a New York court was last heard saying to the judge, um, I'm sorry, but my client has left America, will never, ever return to America. And um, to this very day, he's wanted by the FBI. And I thought there was a, somebody I knew well and I trusted and I learned a big lesson uh, in my career, an unpleasant one, as you can imagine. Well, my, my work with the Starlight Foundation um, became uh, a lot more challenging as I continued to travel uh, more and more. And then something very timely and wonderful was about to change my volunteering life to this very day. You remember my old client, whom I met rushing brochures around the world for, <clears throat> Well, 
he became my mentor and introduced me into, yes, our wonderful, wonderful livery company. And uh, I, I uh, applied, obviously, for, for um, membership, uh, which I was lucky enough to be uh, given. And uh, I, I, Ken, I, I, have to, I have to mention this. I love this picture of Sir Ken Alyssa, uh, now, of course, uh, the Lord Lieutenant of Greater London, having a great joke with Prince Andrew there. Uh, but somebody behind him clearly didn't understand the joke. <laughs> uh, and, 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 of course, um, Sir Ken today is, uh, is quoted as one of the most successful um, people um, in, in our country uh, in terms, and, and he does the most wonderful work uh, and uh, giving aspirations to, to young people. And uh, I, I was so very lucky and very proud to have met him all those years ago, and then for him to have become my mentor and also um, my sponsor to, to take livery with our, with our wonderful livery company. Well, um, th that reminds me of another rather unusual anecdote. Uh, the, I, I was due to be um, elevated into livery, and uh, it, it, was a, it was a slightly embarrassing situation, actually, because it was on uh, the, the afternoon before I was actually due to be chairing an IT conference in California the very next day. And uh, armed with my economy ticket, um, to, to get out to San Francisco, or I can't remember, no, maybe it was San Diego. Um, uh, I clearly wasn't going to be able to attend a, a ceremony in the afternoon. Uh, it was at that stage that I learned the power of our wonderful livery company. I received a call from none other than Sir Brian Jenkins, who of course was a wonderful founder of our livery company, a past Lord Mayor, and of course a past master of our company. And um, Sir Brian explained to me that I clearly had not a clue that one of the members of our livery company was a chap by the name of Lord King, who happened to be the chairman of British Airways. And he, he handed me a little piece of paper with, with Lord King's private telephone number on with an instruction, which by the way, you would never turn down or, or disobey, um, to ring him under all circumstances, explain the situation and ask him to upgrade me uh, to Concord so that I could actually um, get my livery elevation and be in San Francisco the next day. Well, as you can imagine, the, uh, the conversation with Lord King was a little embarrassing, uh, and I got the response which I, I fully deserved and fully expected, which was, I wouldn't even do that for one of my British Airways captains um, on your sort of ticket to be upgraded onto Concorde. Well, sure enough, the next morning I received a special delivery of an upgraded ticket uh, to take my first trip on Concorde. <laughs> and uh, uh, Lord King had come through and Sir Brian, I don't know what he said to Lord King, but it must have been, must have been something I probably shouldn't have heard. And uh, I, uh, I, I was able to take my livery elevation and um, fly on to um, uh, New York and then catch the red eye off to my conference. Now, uh, actually that was good enough, but um, the experience I had on the flight was uh, one which I must tell you about. Uh, I had very sadly uh, um, actually just been through a divorce at that stage in, in my life. And I was sat next to an, an extremely attractive lady um, who appeared to be in exactly the same predicament that I was on, on the aircraft. And we had a, a two and a half hour, almost, well, it was almost deep and in, intimate conversation, sharing notes. And she was talking about her um, having to go and sell uh, uh, her husband Richard's uh, apartment in, in New York. Uh, it, it wasn't until I got off the plane and I was uh, trying to collect my luggage off the carousel when all the men of the aircraft rushed up to me and said, uh, well, what you like, what you like? And it, of course, it took about 30 seconds for them to realize that this incredibly dumb Englishman hadn't had the faintest idea that I'd spent the entire trip sitting next to Cindy Crawford. And of course, she was talking about her husband, Richard Gere. Well, as you can imagine, the conference went well. It was a great opening story to tell them. And when I came back, I, uh, I, I of course, um, called Lord King and thanked him very much indeed for enabling me to, to take my livery, uh, livery elevation, to which, of course, his only remark was, and I hope you enjoy the company. So there's a, a secret power behind our livery company that you probably didn't know about before. 
Well, I joined at this stage uh, a, a newly formed international marketing team at a company called Commodore. Yes, we've all got one, I'm sure, in our roofs somewhere. And my boss, um, standing here in the middle, was the most wonderful guy, Peter Bailey, who is a long-standing and incredibly active member of our livery company. Um, but <laughs> I hasten to add, uh, for both Peter and I, Commodore was a bit of a mixed experience. <laughs> um, so I'll probably tell you a few things which uh, you, you won't know about. They were, of course, um, uh, uh, they had a well-earned reputation of being having a brilliant grasp on consumer electronics, and they were a real trailblazer. Uh, and uh, Peter put together a, an amazing team of international marketers, um, basically to introduce the first Commodore PC and the Amiga products, which were really almost the foundation of the games industry. Uh, and, and it was a it was a wonderful introduction to the gaming industry, of course, which I greatly valued right to this very day. Um, it, it, its demise, however, was its top management team and its absolutely appalling company culture. Uh, uh, Peter, with his magnificent team uh, and I were all whisked off to uh, America um, to uh, appear before Irving Gould, who owned. Uh, most of Commodore in those days, uh, and incidentally, he also owns uh, most of Gambia, which uh, probably is why um, the uh, New York uh, Fifth Avenue offices of Commodore are actually covered in elephant skin, real elephant skin. Ugh. Anyway, um, we Peter stood up at the beginning of the meeting in front of this uh, particular new CEO and uh, uh, used the word, uh, uh, now um, we would like to um, introduce you to our new marketing strategy, at which stage the CEO jumped out of his seat, shook his fist and said, don't you ever use that word strategy with me again? <laughs> well, you can imagine <laughs> for a smart marketing team, that was like a death knell. Um, and I think that um, probably most of the team on the flight back had already got their CVs out and, and were um, rewriting them and, and, and in fact all went on to great careers afterwards, um, except me who seemed to be a bit um, uh, lethargic in getting my CV out. Uh, and I had the most extraordinary phone call um, from this um, CEO who had jumped up in the air um, telling me that he, he wanted me to do a product launch for him. Um, uh, demanding that I did my European job on Monday and Tuesday, that every Wednesday I appeared in uh, on Wednesday afternoons in the office in uh, Fifth Avenue in New York, and that on Thursday and Friday I would alternate between the factory in, uh, uh, in Pennsylvania, and uh, then the next week I would have to spend um, two days in Los Angeles sorting out uh, th this product uh, announcement. And it was, in fact... Uh, an announcement for the introduction of interactive TV. Uh, yes, you guessed it, 10 years before, before the product really uh, and, and the market was ready. Um, it, it was a weekly Concord commute for me. I didn't know whether I was coming or going uh, and, 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 and they were quite a difficult um, uh, team to work with. It wasn't until I was three weeks into it that I discovered why I'd had the phone call. Of course, the first Gulf War had started and none of my colleagues on the east coast of America in Pennsylvania would get on a plane and fly to the west coast. And of course, he quite rightly had assumed that a reserve British Army officer didn't care too much about that sort of stuff and that I was mug enough to say I'll do it. Um, anyway, it, 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 did have its, um, it did have its upside. I got to work with a, a remarkable man. He was actually the inventor of the very first computer game delightful gentleman called Nolan Bushnell, who I'm sure you will all remember that ping pong game. <laughs> that, that was where he started. He was the founder of a company called Atari. Uh, and even to this day, <laughs> my grandchildren love this, he owns a, a, a chain of, of, of American Chuck E. Cheese restaurants, um, which, which are full of animonics and, and, and IT systems. He's a lovely, lovely billionaire. And the nightmare of working for Commodore actually was really worthwhile. Um, one, for having met Peter Bailey and these, and these super people, many of whom I, I'm still in touch with, um, and, and, uh, and to have experienced uh, uh, Nolan Bushnell. Well, 
as it happens, I appear to have ended up in the right place at the right time yet again in my life. And uh, the ex-head of Commodore uh, was Peter Bailey, and he offered me a job at Lotus Development, um, which, of course, brings me to my next lesson, which is never make enemies if you can possibly help it, because you never know who your next boss might be. And this was a wonderful company. And, and just in case Peter is online here, I want to make it quite clear to all of you, the journalists completely screwed this article. Um, Commodore had not scaled down its international marketing subsidiary CMI. Um, it actually, the, everybody had fled from that story I told you a few moments ago. Uh, but it, it was that Lotus had the most fantastic culture. It was a wonderful company um, and, and had great products. Uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed my time there working with Peter and the, and the 30 members of, of the marketing group. Uh, just as an example of the culture, the very first question I was ever asked at interview, which, of course, Peter didn't interview me, was by the VP for Europe and said, well, Michael, what have you ever done for other people? And I, I suddenly realized this was a company with a heart. This was a company that cared about people. And I soon discovered, for example, that it would match employee charity fundraising um, activities. And, and it, it, it was a, a, a delightful group of people. Um, Peter and I launched, um, we did the global launch for Lotus Notes, the first time ever in my life I've managed to persuade America that we could launch the product first in Europe and then second in America. Um, again, talking of uh, video conferencing, we used a company called Picturetel, uh, again in those uh, early days of video conferencing, which worked extremely well and uh, link, linked us live um, between um, CBIT um, in Germany and uh, the offices in, in Boston. I ran global kickoff meetings, uh, which, which were great fun. Um, we, we, we sort of visited um, Vienna with 500 people, Cyprus, et cetera. And, and I ended up basically spending a couple of days a week um, visiting three countries on an airplane going somewhere else. Um, uh, but of course, as you heard me say before, all good things in the IT supplier industry come to an end. And Lotus got sold to IBM, sadly to the demise of, of some of the wonderful products. And uh, both the vice president of Europe, who is a super guy, and all five of our, uh, us as directors were all, all made redundant. Um, I should mention uh, another lesson that I learned. Um, the VP for Europe went on to work for Alan Sugar and realized, of course, that the culture of Lotus with the culture of the company that Alan Sugar ran were definitely incompatible. And he literally fled after three days. Well, I, I took a I took a short term uh, uh, as an interim uh, CEO of uh, uh, an organization called FAST, the Federation uh, Against Software Theft. It was sponsored by Microsoft, and, and what it was all really about, if you like, policing um, and protecting the, um, software industries uh, um, products by uh, making sure that people actually paid for them and, and paid their licenses. I very soon introduced uh, basically a telephone sneak line, and I was totally shocked at how many people were not paying their licenses. And believe it or not, the very first call I ever had was actually from a Royal Air Force um, squadron leader um, telling me that his squadron uh, uh, headquarters had never paid a penny on any software. So it was kind of interesting. Uh, and then... Um, I began to experience, really for the first time in my life, uh, at 48 then, that I, it, it, there, was, there was this haunting, um, awful, rampant ageism within our industry. And uh, I, I, I was very lucky because I eventually joined a quite remarkable and extraordinary company called Gateway. Um, and, and I had to, to, in order to get a decent job uh, as a marketing director role, I did have to move and live in Dublin. Uh, with, with my wife, but actually loved it. Um, it. It was probably the end of three days when I, I discovered really that the average age of the company was 25 years old. It was probably another five days before I, uh, I discovered that my nickname in the company was um, Mr. Zimmerman, <laughs> which I hope was, was meant affectionately. Um, and this was a thousand person 
international call center um, selling direct uh, across Europe um, some actually some extremely smart kit. Um, we were selling direct, my first experience of Ellis ever selling direct, to early adopters for PCs and laptops. And uh, really, for the first time in my life in the industry, I actually knew who my customers were, uh, what they would bought, um, where they would bought it and when. It was a data bonanza. And uh, sadly, um, the, the owner of the company, Ted Waite, um, actually never got that, which is why um, they went down the drain and Dell um, really understood all this magnificent data that they had in their customers. And of course, uh, became very successful. Um, it was during this time that I discovered Mid-America because the headquarters for, for this company was in Sioux City. And I well remember um, catching my first flight out of Chicago in a six-seater plane and sitting in the co-pilot seat, um, landing in Sioux City and, and stepping down the rather rickety um, sort of uh, gangway and smelling something. And the person behind me, um, uh, you know, obviously heard me go, oh, no. And, and he said, well, Michael, you've got to understand you're now in Sioux City where you either work for Gateway or you're skin in hogs. And uh, that was my introduction to the Midwest. <laughs> uh, the people I loved, it, the Midwest was so totally and utterly different from the, the rest of America that I've been used to working in. Uh, lovely people, crime-free, wonderful place to bring up families. Um, I learned a lot uh, in this. It was really tough breaking into the German market who didn't want to buy anything direct without managing to kick it or feel it. Uh, and of course, as you can imagine, it was terribly difficult selling to corporates when all of the all of the computers arrived in Friesian cow <laughs> um, branded boxes. And uh, it, it, that that was that was quite a, a fun little thing. Um, I oh golly, oh, I'm, I'd almost daren't show you this, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, the, the people at Gateway knew that I was very keen on supporting charity. And they knew that I was a member of this extraordinary livery company in the city of London and uh, and that I was about to be made a freeman of the city of London. And they, uh, unbeknown to me, um, uh, ganged together and raised five thousand um, pounds if I would accept a bet during this ceremony. And uh, this was to go to um, uh, my charity. And of course, I accepted the bet. And the bet was basically that whatever was in a black plastic bag when I arrived at the Guildhall, I had to wear. And um, this was not a pleasant experience. <laughs> Thank goodness the clerk to the Chamberlain's Court and the Beadle at the time had a really good sense of humour, but more importantly, a passion for understanding that we would all be raising money for charity. And, and the, there is actually a picture of me wearing the right kit, but uh, never did I think they they'd stitch me up like this with a gateway tie and a gold lame jacket. But uh, nevertheless, <laughs> the, the money was very welcome. The charity loved it. And, and I thought that the team in the Guildhall were great fun and, and very special. And, and it, it was about then, really, that uh, I, uh, I, I finished my 320th trip to the United States. And eventually, um, due to family circumstances, uh, with with uh, one of my sons, I, I really had to come back to the UK. Um, it really at 50 proved completely and utterly impossible to get another suitable role in an IT corporation. And uh, uh, fortunately, I'd continued to chair um, IT conferences in both the USA and, and Eastern Europe. And my network for IT channel marketing and, and a number of other specialist um, roles was uh, really quite unusual. I'd always enjoyed meeting people, um, uh, trying to advance the careers of people in my team. And circumstances literally forced me to take that brave step of starting my own company. And I, I set up um, a very small international IT headhunting company uh, using no capital and, and working actually from my home. And it thrived to my complete astonishment. And I loved it. Um, I worked uh, for clients like IBM, IDG, Dell, and, and numerous other US-based companies. And frankly, I should have done it 10 years earlier. And hopefully, 
uh, hopefully my experience uh, will, will perhaps help other IT professionals to make that independent step much earlier than I did. And I would encourage everyone to be braver than I was in that particular uh, situation. I, I actually spent five years having great fun running my own company, living every, loving every second away from corporate politics. Um, and then it came to an abrupt halt. I entered what I describe as my pro bono career. That's either working for a minimum or, or very little remuneration. Um, but you know what? It proved just as exciting and rewarding as my corporate IT career. Um, but of course, it did put a little bit of financial pressure. Um, the clerk from our livery company resigned and actually moved on to a, a, another livery company. And I was flooded with lovely, friendly people from the livery company saying, go on, Michael, why, why don't you go for it and see if you can apply and get it? Um, and, and sure enough, um, uh, uh, I did. And uh, I, I have no regrets about doing that whatsoever. It was just an amazing amazing experience as Susan will be experiencing now. And of course, I got to work yet again with some of the nicest folk that I've ever met in my career. And yes, that's you. Um, as volunteer members, as Susan will, will bear out, I, I've, it was a little bit like trying to persuade 800 chiefs uh, to work a little bit like charity Indians. Uh, we raised a, a million pounds to build um, Hammersmith Academy. Uh, and of course, I was one of the founding governors of that. Um, and I'm, I was so pleased that we chose to do it in a really needy area. Um, I'd like to think I contributed a little bit to helping um, uh, the Lillian Bayliss uh, School in Lambeth into new buildings and to form it as an IT specialist school. And we did, uh, uh, amongst all of us, I believe, helped to turn around their Ofsted results as well. And of course, it founded my personal passion for education, which was to greatly influence what I was going to do in the future. And of course, this livery company rarefied lifestyle um, enabled me to meet and to get to know some of my IT heroes and to perform um, livery, honorary livery um, ceremonies with, with some incredibly special people. Um, Vint Cerf, for example, obviously uh, one of the great founders of our internet. You know, Vint, apart from being a delightful human being, you could point a camera at him with no notice whatsoever and just say, Vint, please, will you give a wonderful uplifting message to our children in our schools? And he would just trot it out to professional perfection. And, uh, and I, I suspect that Vint still carries that wonderful Google card around with him, which, which describes him as the internet guru. What a lovely guy, what a beautiful communicator. Um, I also, of course, had the great honor of performing this ceremony for Sir Tim Berners-Lee. And I, mu I must tell you just a little, a little quick anecdote about Tim, if I may. Um, as you can imagine, uh, for those of you that have never seen this ceremony, uh, the clerk has to sort of roll out a scroll uh, with words that, that are then said by our wonderful um, incoming honorary um, liveryman. And uh, of course, I would always send the words off to Vint and, and to uh, Sir Tim well in advance. Um, Sir Tim, um, first communication I had from him was as he jumped into a cab, um, at Heathrow and he was whisking his way on to us at the hall and he told me he said Michael Michael I've just read the words I don't get this I've got to I've got to obey and take orders from the master but I, I don't know who the master is or you know this I'm really struggling with this and uh, as, as as Susan will appreciate on the spot um, a clerk tries to mend a situation rather than cause a calamity <laughs> and I said don't don't worry Sir Tim don't worry when we come to unscroll the thing, just read the words that are there. And I, I got off, I went off and I got one of those little sticky yellow things and I covered over the words, <laughs> obey the master and take his instruction. You know, nobody noticed <laughs> in, in that ceremony that I covered up the words and we, I've never said another word about it, I think until today. So there, there's a lovely little story um, uh, about Sir Tim, who of course is just the most remarkable uh, gentleman as well. Um, I, I, I also got to meet, of course, lots of Lord Mayors, as Susan will have done, um, quite helpful too. Uh, recently, uh, Peter Esselin was, was kind enough to um, open the BCS, new BCS offices in the city for me. Um, I even met Buzz Armstrong, um, 
who was a, a special guest of um, Dame Stephanie Shirley at a business lunch when she was master. Um, it was, it, Susan, you'll love this. Um, we, we had to do his speech before the meal um, because um, immediately after the first course, he had to leave, jump back on a plane because he was due to host a cosmonaut um, meeting in Chicago that night. So a little bit of flexibility, but, but again, what a great experience. And of course, my wonderful, wonderful hero, mentor and guidance, Dame Stephanie Shirley. What a privilege to have, have met and, and, and known. I, Susan, let me just give you a word of warning. Um, Steve, of course, gave us a wonderful, wonderful haul and enabled us to, to grow and improve as a livery company beyond our wildest dreams. Never ever touch anything in that hall without consulting with Steve first, because she so deserves to be a party to anything we might wish or want to do. And you should always be looking for her approval and support on it. Well, um, you, you probably, um, you know, I, I now understand, of course, the unique makeup of the city and, and the wonderful 15 years voluntary work that people perform before becoming the alderman or the sheriff or, or the Lord Mayor. And after five years um, as clerk or five and bit, I think it was, um, I, it was time for me really to retire at a wonderful occasion, which was the celebration of our Royal Charter. Um, for those of you that, that uh, uh, weren't lucky enough to be here, this, this was a terrific occasion. It took me about six months to, to plan it together with uh, uh, Charles Hughes, who was the master at the time. And um, we conducted a service in St. Paul's and uh, a, a march through the city with the Pikeman Musketeers. Uh, and then, of course, His Royal Highness um, Prince Edward uh, was the member of the royal family who, who very um, gentlemanly and very expertly um, conferred the royal charter on us. Uh, I must tell you a quick story, however. Maybe you don't know why um, I'm carrying a pizza box here. Well, the reason is because um, earlier that morning, I was meant to go and collect from the Privy Council our royal charter. But there had been <laughs> the previous week a bit of a crisis in so much that parchment, <laughs> yes, parchment had had actually um, uh, there was none, there was no parchment. It had run out of supplies. So in planning this day, well, I had to make the assumption that there wasn't going to be a Royal Charter. So we came up with this idea whereby um, we could take the box we could, off, off the altar in St. Paul's Cathedral, march with it through the streets of, of London um, and, and uh, s s sit it in front of um, His Royal Highness at the dining table in Mansion House, uh, obviously um, explaining that uh, this, this was in a box in order that we didn't spill gravy on it or anything. Uh, and it wasn't literally and until a few hours before we started this ceremony that I actually got to know that we had a royal charter <laughs> and was, was able to put it in the pizza box. Um, there, there, there is a, there's about a three quarter of our full program on this, which I wouldn't recommend, but this will give you a flavor of this extraordinary occasion. Who would have thought that just 25 years after our founders booted the idea, we would have become one of the largest and most active of the livery companies? Fantastic day for our company. That was uh, that that was something really quite remarkable. Um, I I literally the next day um, disappeared off to spend time with my family uh, in Pittsburgh in, in America, where we disappear every summer to try and give some respite time to uh, my daughter and my Downs autistic uh, grandson out there. Um, uh, and I have to say, um, I received a very surprised <laughs> message uh, from the livery company after I'd been there for about a week, 
uh, where I was invited back um, to my complete astonishment uh, to carry out a three-year role as, of course, uh, wardens and a master of our livery company. And what an incredible privilege that was. Uh, I, I'm not going to talk about my year because I think Stefan is going to do that. And, and of course, it was one of the most memorable years of my life. But it was wonderful training, of course, um, to, uh, 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 for my role, which followed on very shortly afterwards at, at the BCS as uh, the deputy president, president and, and the past president. And the experience that I gained in chairing court and, and, and meetings and acting as an ambassador for the industry and so on, uh, was was a, a, a wonderful way to build me into that organization with its 58,000 uh, members. Uh, the high, highlight of that year was quite definitely um, the most sensational <laughs> graduation ceremony in Sri Lanka, where the BCS had 5,000 uh, uh, members. It was a it was a pretty tough 10 days where I found myself having to give speeches on sub subjects about which I knew absolutely nothing and uh, shaking an awful lot of hands, but an incredible experience. Um, and that, of course, led to new volunteering roles in education. I'm nearly there, folks. Uh, if, if any of you are still there, you'll be delighted to hear I'm coming towards the end. <laughs> Um, that, that I, I, I decided that I knew everything about education because of what I'd learned in the livery company. Oh, what a mistake that was. Um, I then spent the next five years as a governor and, and then chair of governors of a desperately failing secondary school in a very depressed area of Hampshire, uh, which, believe it or not, had had five head teachers in just the one year. And uh, I, I found myself you know, going on two or three courses uh, almost every week uh, in order to be effective and, and to understand, frankly, what they were even talking about. I thought the military language was tough, but the, the educational language is even more challenging. Um, so I became chair of governors and, and then uh, part of Chichester University Academies Trust, which is a teacher training and, and, and a, a sports un, um, uh, university. And, and of course, this turned out to be uh, eventually a, a very good school. Um, it was a remarkable experience. Uh, I, I'm so I'm so pleased, uh, and I would I would recommend anybody to be a, a school uh, governor at some stage in your life. It's so satisfying, and, and I stepped down after six years of, of being on the trustee board, and and now I'm what's called the member. So I'm I'm actually a, a, a non-paying shareholder, uh, and I'm responsible for ensuring that the board behaves appropriately and does what it should be doing in the way it should be doing it. Um, we, we managed to get a brand new school, 30 million pounds we, we raised um, in this very depressed area and that school is now doing fabulously. So uh, such, a, such an extraordinary thing. Now, just in case you thought by some quirk or mistake that my volunteering life was ending, you would have to be wrong. Um, over the last year, I joined uh, an organization called the Positive Transformation Initiative. It, it's kind of the ultimate network of networks. It's made up very largely of IT and legal counsel volunteers. And it's all about increasing opportunities for deserving young people, veterans, um, ex-offenders, and so on. And really trying to help them kickstart their lives and, and their careers. It's all about supporting existing charities and hopefully um, some of you might uh, consider uh, perhaps giving a little bit of voluntary time and energy to this. You'll notice yet again, <laughs> Sir Ken Alyssa comes into my life. He's the chairman of this organization and none other than the founder and the CEO of, of this organization is none other than our Dan Brown, who joined us quite recently as one of our new freemen. So uh, a great organization. And I'm, I'm very pleased in some very small way to be um, uh, uh, contributing to it. Anyway, um, back back um, for the last uh, few minutes, if I may. Uh, in in um, in uh, you you could be forgiven for thinking that I love dressing up. Uh, to of course you'd be perfectly correct. So in another volunteer role, I spent the last fifteen years as a pikeman in the Lord Mayor's ceremonial um, bodyguard. Uh, that's also, by the way, one of Her Majesty's three special guards. Um, I, I have to be capable of marching for five and a half miles in the Lord Mayor's show here, of course, with Sir Andrew Palmley. And I can continue to do it, I'm reliably told, until when I fall over, 
uh, I don't need a member of the public to uh, to pick me up. So hopefully at least you'll see me at um, in November's Lord Mayor's show. I've met more presidents, kings, queens, princes and princesses of some countries I didn't even know existed. And some, I must confess in reflection, perhaps I wish I hadn't supported. Um, and apart from parading in Boston, Massachusetts, um, um, other highlights have included doing um, charity sheet drives across London Bridge, um, where I've been offering, you know, perhaps a little pointed encouragement to sheep that were at the, uh, the lazy ones at the back. Um, and of course, I also did a, a guard for Lady Thatcher's wake. Um, but more importantly, and I hasten to add, uh, this next slide was included um, before we lost our wonderful, wonderful His Royal Highness, um, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, and I want to tell you two stories about him, if I may. Uh, I was on guard at, um, at Buckingham Palace once uh, at a royal garden party. Her Majesty, and there was a sort of a big gangway through the middle of, of all of the guests. Her Majesty was going down one side and um, His Royal Highness, um, Prince Philip was coming down my side and I was on about my third stand sort of leapfrogging down down and uh, I came to my third stand and a, a, a veteran moved up to me with his wonderful uh, regimental blazer and his regimental tie and he jabbed me with his arm in my breastplate saying you watch he'll recognize me and he'll, he'll know me and I, I'm standing there thinking like heck um, and, uh, and as, as um, His Royal Highness approached, I'm, I'm eyeballing him, pointing him on my immediate right to the group of VIPs, uh, where, of course, he's expected to shake hands and, and, and look after them. He takes one look at the veteran next to me, my new veteran friend, walks straight over to him, says, I know you. When did we last meet? Well, now, what was that time? He has a wonderful five minute conversation with him totally and utterly ignoring all of the VIPs waiting on my right hand side. And that was the day I, I, I learned to really respect this gentleman immensely. And this particular picture, I, very quickly, I'm going to just tell you one other story. Um, uh, the Pikeman Musketeers have been practicing for what seemed like months after, after work and in the evenings at the weekends to get our drill right. And Her Majesty and um, His Royal Highness uh, Prince Philip were coming along to inspect us. We rehearsed everything. We even rehearsed moving in two minutes from the end of our parade onto um, this, this sort of uh, pedestal where we were all going to be photographed by the international press. And uh, sadly, we, we, we'd, we'd measured the seating, um, forgetting that we weren't wearing our armor during the rehearsal. So we were all four inches fatter and there were people falling off the ends from quite high distances. And, 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 the, and the whole thing was very jovial and, and everybody was laughing like mad. And then to crown it all, uh, the captain um, escorted Her Majesty to her seat. And as, as he sat down, the, the part of armor you can see on there draped across her legs. And the Duke inimitably, in his wonderful style, just turned round to the captain, uh, for those of us that were in earshot, including the guy at the back who's scratching his head, and, and simply said, Captain, get your hands off my blank wife. And that to me epitomized this fantastic thing. The whole place fell apart. I had the best pictures we've ever seen of Her Majesty. And it, it just sort of set off this extraordinary occasion. So there are, there, there are some stories of, of my life as, as a pikeman and, and some finished off, I, I would hope you would agree, very, um, very appropriately. So I'm, I'm, I'm winding up and I'm going to finish. So a couple of slides just to remind you of some of the horrible lessons I've learned and the terrible mistakes I've made. Um, uh, I've, of course, I've been hugely honoured to have been a member of our livery company for the past 27 years. And, and God willing, I will continue to serve and support our livery and indeed our industry and, until I drop. And as you've heard, I have frankly been in the right place more times and far, far more often than I deserve. If I had been a rich man, I would happily have paid for every single day of my career in the IT industry. And my volunteer roles have helped me as a, a child of charity, I hope, to try and pay back into society 
and to do my best to make IT good for society. Um, thank you very much for a illustrious description of your career. Wonderful. Um, I thought I knew. I learned lots more about you today again. Um, amazing the work you've done and the spectrum of items that you've covered in your career. Really good. The question I have for you is, do you speak any foreign languages? Because you tra you've travelled the world. So I just wanted to know, is there a language that you speak and which one do you speak strongly? Well, I, the, when I went round the world, of course, um, nobody spoke English and I didn't speak any of their languages. And I learnt that by acting and, and the, your voice modulation and your hands, you could get away with absolutely anything anywhere. I do speak French, not particularly well, but of course, I've been blessed with working in the IT industry. They won't employ anybody anywhere around the world unless you speak English. So, I, uh, you know, terrible to admit, but no other than French. Yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. And thank you for the brilliant presentation you did this evening. Thank you very much. Really well done. Thank you for hanging in. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you. Ian. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Michael because I'd always known Michael was a really cool guy, but I had absolutely no idea how spectacularly cool he is. And what a fantastic career he had. And that I just think it's absolutely wonderful that he shared it all with us. And there's just a, um, a, a, there's just a reflection, and I wonder if Michael looks on it that way, because you were talking about being adventurous. Um, isn't it the case that life is really just like you're walking along a corridor of a whole series of doors, and you just press every door, and whichever one opens, you go in and just... And you, and you see what happens. I completely agree. But the secret is that young people are brought up in, a, in an environment where there are enough doors for them to walk through. Because I, I, I'm a huge believer that everybody can be absolutely brilliant at something. But unless you have a start in life where maybe you can change your jobs around, maybe you get an, an opportunity to make mistakes and to, and to experience new things, unless you find something of which you are passionate and you love, you're never going to be quite as successful. Ian, I was going to say that the Royal Charter would never, ever have happened had you not been so inspirational in enabling us to have a special service in St. Paul's Cathedral. I need to explain briefly, Ian was my secret weapon when we met the chapter of St. Paul's, who for the previous three weeks had said at no to absolutely everything I'd asked. And Ian came in, and I don't want to embarrass you on this, but he quoted the Bible verses back for every objection that came out. <laughs> and being a, an amazing <laughs> lawyer had everybody round their little fingers. And it was only through you and your, thank goodness, good guidance and intervention that we, we got that service at all. Well, gosh, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for attending. Uh, Michael, I can only echo what Ian said. I, I don't know. I know more about your career than I ever dreamed of. I, it was a an absolutely fantastic um, uh, story. You, you omitted to say, but you had to read the slide rather carefully, that you were the head boy. So you started at the top and continued to remain there throughout. Well, uh, as I, I, I believe firmly, your education is your biggest and best start in life. Uh, you know, as a charity child, I was so incredibly lucky to have been given a fantastic education by, by the RAF Benevolent Fund. And to be honest, I think without that start in life, I would never have had the great luck, good fortune, or the nerve to do half the things that I did. And, and uh, I, I think I owned a Commodore. I certainly was a very early Lotus Notes user. My company, oh, hooray! One of the first <laughs> companies in the city to use Lotus Notes, mm -hmm. thanks to an absolute genius um, IT director we had. Um, so there were a number of things that I you touched on memories in my life. Um, I'm extremely jealous of Steve Jobs and Cindy Crawford, particularly the latter. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, so a big thank you to, and just to mention, you were wearing this. Ah. 
and, and this was made, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's one of two of the master's hats. I'm not sure the other one was made by your daughter, but this one certainly was made by your daughter, Victoria. Um, it's a, as a hat man, I love wearing it. I think, you know, it's a wonderful sort of highway robbery hat. Um, so it, uh, thank you for that. Uh, so my thanks to you. Uh, for putting all the time and energy, and as I think somebody said, the wonderful photographs that you, you'd assembled, and, and I certainly couldn't do that in my career. So thank you, everybody, and uh, to Michael, thank you for a wonderful evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, thank you for hanging in, everybody. Michael, terrific. Wonderful. Brilliant. Really good. Thank you.